Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Turn to John 5. John 5. As we go through this series, I'll pull away for a little bit on a few moments of time in this teaching to just reveal to you things again that are confirming what we're talking about, about this aspect of God's design for man, created spirit, soul, and body. When Adam sinned, what happened in the garden? When Adam sinned, his spirit died. And when his spirit died, he went from being a three-part being to a two-part being. Soul, functioning primarily as the one that was ruling his life and his body carrying out what his soul wanted. Because of that, he then obviously affected the plan that God originally had. But Jesus, in helping us to be born again, put within us a brand new spirit. And he recreated in us the very uh, aspect of what Adam had in the garden, a new spirit made in the likeness and the image of God. When you go to the book of John chapter 20, and you look at what Jesus did in breathing on his disciples and saying, receive the Holy Spirit, they got more than just the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came in them and birthed a brand new spirit. And that word breathe in the Greek language is the synonymous phrase to what you go back to in Genesis in the very beginning when God breathed into man into his nostrils the breath of life. And that breath of life phrase refers to the fact that he gave him a spirit with a soul. Now, once our spirit man died, we still had a soul. But what did he breathe back into us? A brand new spirit. We once again had the opportunity and the privilege now as a born again child of God. Think about this. Every born-again child of God on the planet has the ability to walk in God's design. Now, the reason that's significant is we've already looked at in Psalms 8. Because remember, David in Psalms 8 was reflecting, as you got to know, as a shepherd boy sitting out there watching those sheep one night, saying, God, look at all your creation, all that you've made. And then he says, "But, but what's man that you're mindful of him? And without even thinking about what's coming out of his mouth, all that inspired by the Holy Spirit, God speaks through him and says, I have made man to have dominion over the works of my hands. Well, that confers with what Genesis said. Because when he created man in the context of the garden, (coughs) excuse me, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, what did he say to do? Have dominion. Have dominion over what God had created, works of his hands. So for us to function... In this rightful place of what I'm going to say is not just dominion, but a place of authority. A place of authority. God wants us to walk in this dominion, place of authority, doing his will. What do we got to do? Function as a three-part being. And when we function as a three-part being, we walk in our rightful dominion as a child of God. What can defeat you? Thank you. Nothing. Nothing. Just like Jesus could not be defeated. Doesn't mean you can't be attacked. You're in a war zone. But this is why Christians don't understand that if they don't come back to God's design, not functioning out of their soul. Think about how many years have been spent in Christianity and in religion. I shouldn't say Christianity, Christendom of what people thought was Christianity. Trying to be able to live successful. Trying to overcome stuff they knew that they had battles with. Trying to be able to walk in positions of victory over not only their flesh but works of darkness, etc. Totally out of their soul. Totally out of their own willpower. And failing time after time after time after time. It is this lack of understanding God's design. Go back to the, uh, the main graphic, guys, that we have. It's, it's a misunderstanding of this God's design of spirit, soul, and body functioning together that literally has hindered man all these years and not being able to experience and to walk in what God has for their life. Because if we don't understand that, then we're right back in no, no better off position than Adam was after the fall. And I'll get, not that one, the original uh, graphic, Josh, sorry, that for, the ver- first one with the guy on it. And it shows God's design for man. So you got to understand that because of the fall, literally what happened? Well, that spirit died, right? So man's functioning out of his soul. His body's just carrying out its orders. But when you got born again, that spirit came back to life. Thank you, Jesus. 
So now we can come back to God's design for man. That's the reason I have it written out this way. Spirit, soul, and body. And then below it, God's design for man. If we function as a three-part being, guess what we come back to? God's design. And now we can walk in our rightful authority. Now go back to that inner court graphic for just a moment. So, And you can stay there if you want. So realize this. What we've got to learn to do then, because before you got born again, guess what you didn't know how to do? You didn't know how to do that. This is like, you know, on-the-job training, right? So it's like you got hired for a new job. And okay, we're going to hire you, but we're going to train you, obviously, while you're helping to do the job. And so they're showing you how to do it. How many know day one you're not going to perfect it? How many know it's going to take a little while, right, to kind of get good at it? I doubt Kim's ever hired anybody that's never done bakery work before, and they just immediately went back there in the kitchen and started throwing, you know, uh, cakes together and all this kind of stuff and just doing it perfect, right? No, it takes a while to learn. Well, guess what? It takes us a while to learn. God's design. But if we'll learn it, we can function in the very place that God called us to function. Just like Jesus. I said, just like Jesus. So let's look at a couple clues from Jesus' life that show us this very same thing. Are you with me tonight? John 5, 19. Look at this. Jesus answered and he said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son, listen to this, can do nothing. Nothing of himself. Now we can... And honestly, Jesus could have. He just chose not to. He chose not to. He could have done something on his own. Garden of Gethsemane proves that. Not my will, Father. Right? Right. But your will be done. Sure, he could have. He just chose not to. So he said, Assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. You ought to have the rest of this highlighted or underlined in your Bible. Watch. But what he sees the Father do... For whatever he does, the son also does what? In like manner. Now, how does he see him do those things? We're going to talk about that tonight. How does he see him do those things? Verse 20 says, for the father what? Loves the son and he does what? He shows him all things that he himself does, the father, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, I don't have time tonight, but if you go study John 17, Jesus prayed a prayer for me and you. And in John 17, in that prayer, he literally said, Father, I have given them your name. I have given them an understanding, in other words, of all that you have caused me, caused me to come and do for them and accomplish for them. And he goes on to say in that very context of that prayer that the Father loves us the same as he loves Jesus. Because we are now sons and daughters of God. So look at verse 20 again because of this. For the Father loves the Son. Well, so does he love you. The same. John 17 says. So we could put ourselves in that verse and say, the Father loves me. Say he loves me. Watch this. And he shows me. Come on. He shows me all things that he himself does. See, if he's going to show them to his son Jesus, because he loves him, he loves us the same. If we're going to walk in what Jesus did, guess what he's not going to do? Hold anything back. He will do the same for us as he did for Jesus. He will show us all things That he, the Father himself, does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. So what is the Father going to show him? What is it that the Father, let me back up for, for the relationship to Jesus. What is it that the Father showed Jesus? You ready? What the Father is doing. Not what you're going to do. Your will. Not what you want to walk out with, with your plan of your life. No. He's going to show you what he already has as a plan. To give you an opportunity to get in on it. If you want to walk in God's design for your life, there's nothing about this life that you should be living out your plans. Nothing. Jesus carried out no plan of his own. None. I only do what I'm seeing the Father do. It is the Father who loves me, listen, and he shows me what he, what he is already doing. And that's what I carry out. So for us to come back to God's design, we're not trying to walk in, as we're going to talk more about tonight, about relating to the aspect of our will and our emotions. We're not trying to carry out what we think or what we want. If we're walking in God's design, guess whose plan we're carrying out? God's. That includes everything. Go to John 8. That includes everything relationship to the job you have or the business you own or the family you have or if you're not married, who you are, who you're not supposed to marry. Just imagine if every person, I understand, don't get me wrong, 
You know, people a lot of times get into situations they didn't mean to intentionally. But, you know, you think about, sadly, all the broken marriages, all the broken relationships, all the aspects of what's happened in relationship to people's lives, being taken advantage of through wrong bosses, businesses, on and on we could go. None of that would have happened if they'd have been what? If they'd have been walking in God's design. Because God's plan is not a plan of failure. God's plan is a plan of success. And a lot of people think, well, man, we're, we're not going to walk in that kind of success. Who said? Who said you can't? If you can walk out the life Jesus walked out, John 14, 12, if you can do the works Jesus did, how could you not walk out what God has for you? What we've got to do is learn this design. Because if we learn this design, guess what we're going to get in on? What he has already planned for us. What he has already have in the works for us. And it's not really our plan, it's his. It's what he is already doing to want to lead us into of what he has available for us. John 8, 29. So in John 8, 29, here's another statement Jesus makes about this. Watch this. Jesus said in John 8, 29, you ought to have this all highlighted or underlined it. Notice, he who sent me, who sent him? Who sent him? A little more direct. The Father. He who sent me is what? Now, wait a minute. If he sent him and he was with him... And now, again, John 17 even goes on to tell you in that prayer, as you send me, Father, so I send them. The same way you sent me into the earth, I send them. How did God send him in the earth? He sent him with him, with him, by his spirit. He also who sent me is what? Tell me. Please tell me. He's with me. Now, I want you to read along with me so I know you're staying connected. I don't ask you to repeat stuff. Because you're ignorant or don't know it. I'm just asking you to stay connected. So you'll hear it with your own words. Listen in. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word. There's nobody better to speak the word over your life than you. Then it becomes more real to you. Watch this. He who sent me is what? With me. Who sent him? The father did. Notice this. And the father has not what? He has not left me alone. For I always do. Underline it. I always do those things that do what? Please him. How are we supposed to live our life? Everything we do should be pleasing to God. But this isn't now coming out of the soul realm that we got to figure out a way to will ourselves into what pleases God. No, no. You come back to God's design. You function as a spirit, soul, and a body. And when all three of those are working together, guess what you're going to do? What's pleasing to him? Just like Jesus. You're not going to function any less. So look at it again. I want you to see this again. So Jesus said, he who sent me is with me. Now we can put ourselves in that verse. Because I could take you to John 17 and show you where Jesus prayed and said, Father, just as you sent me, I send them. So we've been sent into this earth no different. So literally we could say, notice this, say, God, my Father who sent me is with me. Say, he's with me. Watch this. The Father, say it, has not left me alone. I always do those things that please Him. Now, how do you do that? You walk out your life under His design as a spirit-led, soul-submitted, body-as-the-slave-designed human. And when you do that, relating to the things of God as a son or daughter of God, you go beyond the human realm... And now you walk in the context of what God has for you as a child of God. John 12, one more set of verses here, John 12. So these are all things we can apply to us because, again, just as I said, John 17, go read the prayer later tonight before you go to bed. He prayed this prayer over us that everything that the Father had done in his life, the Father wants to do with us. So we've read that he would not do anything except what he saw the Father doing. I'm only going to do what I already see the Father doing. And that's why everything I do, I do to please Him. Well, let's look at this verse, these set of verses. John 12, 49. If you're there, say amen. Amen. For I have not spoken on my own authority. Now, you know, notice the word authority is added there. It's italicized. It's not in the original. Even though He spoke with authority, in truth, in this case, it actually probably has more understanding and power to remove that word that was not originally there. Because all he's saying is, I've not spoken on my own. Meaning what? I didn't come up with my own words. What if in every relationship you quit coming up with your own words? What if in every aspect of your finances you quit coming up with your own words? 
What if pertaining to the healing and health of your body, you quit coming up with your own words? What if in relating to anybody else in the world and the things of the world, you quit coming up with your own words? Amen? How different would our life be? Very different because we would be functioning under God's design. What Jesus did, we can do. Again, John 14, 12 is clear about that. So notice, I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me gave me a command. Notice, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Underline it. Therefore, whatever I speak, notice this, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Amen. Say, therefore, therefore. whatever... I say, it should be just as the Father has told me to speak. Well, you can do that. You can get there. Now, a lot of, a lot of believers think they cannot. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because we're going to come back and deal with this emotion thing again tonight. And it's because they let their context of their soul rule them to the degree that they're not doing what we're teaching you here about what you and I have seen now over and over for multiple verses as an example to us of what God showed us with the tabernacle of the design of man. It was a perfect picture. Perfect picture. What they were doing obviously was a temporary thing and how they had to deal with sacrifices and stuff. But we've already seen in the New Testament, it's symbolic for today. And that we now, as a spiritual house, are being built up to offer up spiritual sacrifices. All that means to be a spiritual house and to offer up spiritual sacrifices, all that means is to live under God's design as a three-part being. If you're doing that, you are living as a spiritual house. What's that mean? Your spirit's ruling. Your spirit will never agree with your soul. I want you to get that. I've told you this before. Your spirit will never agree with your soul. That's not how it works. The soul's to be submitted to the spirit. If I'm trying to get my spirit submitted to my soul, it will never happen because the soul is fleshly and carnal in its nature. And the Bible says there's nothing good that dwells in it of itself. And therefore, it will never submit. My spirit will never submit to my soul. I must deal with my soul in this inner court part of what we see of the tabernacle that's a part of my inner court of my life, my soul, mind, will, and emotions, so that my spirit can rise and dominate. And if my spirit dominates, then my soul is doing nothing more than submitting to what my spirit knows to do. Well, guess what your spirit knows to do and say? What the Father shows you to do and what the Father shows you to say. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Think about this. What if I know the words coming out of my mouth are only the words of the Father? Then who's releasing those words through me? God is. How powerful are they? How many think God's word will work in your life every time? How many think it will never fail? Well, why are a lot of Christians failing? They're not saying what God says. They're not doing what God says to do. You know why? I'll tell you why. They're letting their mind, reasoning, Their will, their own desires, fleshly, and their emotions, how they feel about stuff, to rule them. And if you do that, you're never going to see God's will fulfilled in your life. You're never going to walk out God's plan. And therefore, you're going to do what? You're going to miss out on God's design for your life. I want to do that. So I don't want to do that. So according to what we've been seeing clearly from multiple scriptures, I just wanted to show you some examples of Jesus. Go back to James 1 tonight as I'm talking. Let me get you... Headed the right direction here. James chapter 1. We've been talking about how the Bible again reveals in the New Testament that that three-part temple was represented of us. The outer court represented our bodies, which we know, what relationship to what we've already seen. How do you get into the outer court? You came through a gate. And that's representing, under the Old Testament, a way for all three of these parts to work together, which represents to us salvation. Because the only way you could have that happen is get born again. you you got to get that spirit back alive. So you're not functioning as a two-part being, but now you can once again function as a three-part being. So how do we get that spirit alive? Well, we come through the gate. Relationship to the outer court, we make a decision to come to Jesus. Receive what God has for us, salvation. 
Jesus is that gate, very clear in John chapter 10. After we come through the gate, we get born again. We accept the blood that he shed for us. We enter into what now is an ability to walk out God's design as a three-part being. Next step, we do what? We actually go to the altar of sacrifice, just like they do with the animals. And we offer our body as a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 1. And then we go to the labor. This is before you get to the inner court. And they went to the labor. It was a big bronze, uh, big wash basin that they would have to wash themselves in after doing all the sacrifices before they could go into the inner court. And that represents to us what? Water baptism. That we're recognizing in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4, that we have already been delivered from sin. And now we have the ability, born again. Come on. Now we have the ability, born again, to start coming into this inner court, this soul of ours, and making it submit to our spirit man. And how do we do that? We got to deal with our mind, our will, and our emotions. And as we've already shown you, in that inner court, there were three parts in that inner court. Altar of incense, table of showbread, and also the lampstand, representing mind, will, and emotions. Don't get focused so much on altar, showbread, lampstand. Get focused on what they represent, mind, will, and emotions. So for all this to work, where do we start? Number one, to ever even begin to minister and deal with your soul in that inner court, what do you got to do? Got to give God's word first place in your life. Because everything else in your life relating to how you're going to fix your soul is going to function based off of that word. And if you and I understand that, then truly the word needs to be significant to our life. This is what I'm trying to help the men with. And Brandy followed suit with the ladies. Why I'm having them to take a time every day, one chapter, read a chapter, New Testament as we're going through it. Write something down that stands out to you. Write something down that actually stands out as a verse or something God spoke to you or just something that you thought was unusual, different, whatever. Write it down because what you're doing is you're beginning to put the word first place. If the word's not first place in your life, you're never going to come back to God's design. You can't go into the inner court, your soul, and do what you need to do to get it submitted to your spirit, listen to me, without the word of God. We'll say that again. You will never get your soul, mind, will, and emotions. You'll never get it submitted to your spirit man who's now alive in you without the word of God. It won't happen. So this is why you and I have to make God's word first place in our life. If it's not, we're going to miss out on this God's design for our life. But in Jesus' name, may that not be us at Christian Faith Fellowship. I'd like a little better amen than that. So then as we come into this inner court with the word of God in our life, what do we do with that word? Number two, we renew our minds to the word of God. So out of these three elements, the mind represents our reasoning faculties, how we think through things, etc. And what you and I need to do is start taking that word and meditating on it so that we can do what? Totally renew our minds to God's word. To meditate just means you set your thoughts on it. Romans 8, remember? If you set your mind on the things of the flesh, what are you going to do? Be carnally minded. But if you start setting your mind on the things of the spirit, that's just meditating. Not like sitting around meditating. No, we're just talking about what you're thinking about. And if you go through your day and you start thinking about now who the Bible says you are, what the Bible says you have, what the Bible says you can do, you're meditating on God's word. What are you doing? You're changing your mind. What are you renewing your mind to? Tell me. Careful. What are you renewing your mind to? The new man. The new you. Understanding this spirit. Because the whole goal is to simply renew ourselves to know, hey, this spirit guy in this holy of holies, he's the one that needs to rise up and dominate. He's in there. I said he's in there. So is the power of God. So is the Shekinah glory of God. So we got to meditate on God's word to renew our minds so that we start thinking spiritual, not carnal. As we continue to do that, we also got to deal with our will. How do we deal with our will? Number three, you got to start practicing the word. And we showed you multiple verses for this. What are we practicing, church? What the Bible says we now are in Christ Jesus. We start recognizing what the Bible says about us. And to renew our minds and know that only and not act upon it is to not have a mind fully renewed. Our will has to be involved. And that means we have to address our will by looking to the Word of God and starting to practice what God teaches us as a New Testament believer we're to do. And when we start walking that out, we start walking in line with that new nature. Now, I showed you 
multiple things to deal with on that relating to your will, including Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in a time of prayer in addressing his will. You have to address what to address your will? Your thought life. Your thought life. If you remember, we showed you 2 Corinthians 10. This is all review. We showed you 2 Corinthians 10. You're not going to walk out God's will without doing what? Dealing with wrong thoughts. So as I'm renewing my mind, now I know who I am. Now I know what I have. Now I know what I can do. And when a thought comes contrary to those things, what do I got to do? I've got to now do what? I've got to literally practice what God's word says by taking that thought captive and declaring God's word. If you don't do that, you're not practicing the word. If you're not practicing the word, you're not going to experience God's will. If you don't bring those thoughts into captivity, you will not experience God's will. Because those thoughts will eventually become words out your mouth and they'll become actions that you'll carry out. Isn't it nice to know again that wrong thoughts unspoken die unborn? Amen. But you got to deal with them. You got to deal with them. And the more you and I will do what? Practice God's word. The more we'll begin to get our will subjected to this new man. We're not in any way, shape, or form with our willpower trying to walk out what we think a Christian should be. All we're doing is walking out what the Bible says we already are. Right? Not what we think we should be. No, you're not going to be. You already are. Come on, somebody. You already are above and not beneath. You already are, obviously, in the sight of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus. You already are one spirit with the Lord. Start acting like it. Start acting like it. Look at Jesus' life. Say, I'm just like him. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. That's who I am. So this is why you got to put into practice the Word of God relating to how you deal with thoughts that come contrary to what now you know God's will is. Amen? Amen. And then we get to this third ear of our soul. So remember, this inner court is where the actual uh, priest in the Old Testament spent every day. Guess what you need to do? You need to deal with that every day if you want to be successful. So we got to deal with the soul of ours every single day. Renewing our mind, dealing with our will, Dealing with wrong thoughts, practicing the word, and the biggie. You ready? Deal with your emotions. Tell your neighbor, you need to deal with your emotions. <laughs> you you got to understand this. Think about all the painful things that have been experienced in life. All because people went by their emotions. <laughs> now, when I say emotions, I'm not just talking about getting angry I'm not just talking about that or, in essence, getting scared or fearful included. You know what else I'm talking about? That you yourself even allow how you feel relating to other people. Nobody loves me. That's an absolute lie. You're going by your feelings. Absolute lie. Pastor had a gal in his church years ago. I've never had anybody come directly tell me this. I actually did have one say something kind of similar to it. He had a gal come to his church one time. Uh, uh, come to him after, excuse me, after a church service one time, said, Pastor, nobody loves me here. I'm not coming back. So what do you mean nobody loves you here? Well, nobody loves me. How do you know? Well, nobody talks to me. Do you talk to anybody? <laughs> well, no. I just come sit down, but nobody comes and talks to me. Well, that's why nobody talks to you. You reap what you sow. Right. True. Yeah. Isn't that a Bible verse? Yes, right. Yeah, I think that's somewhere in the New Testament, isn't it? Right. Yeah, Galatians 6. Whatever a man sows, he'll reap. He said, listen, you really think we don't love you here? He said, now I'm going to be real honest with you because you know I'm your pastor. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just going to be real honest with you. Can I be real honest? Yeah, pastor. You're not the most likable person to be around. You've been here for years. If we didn't love you, you know what we'd have done? We'd have posted an usher at the door and said, we don't love her here. Keep her out. And we'd have never let you back. You don't think we don't love you? We put up with you. We put up with all your shenanigans, all your little attitudes, all your little issues. And yet here we are still loving on you. Come on. on. Still treating you just like one of the family. And you think we don't love you? You think nobody here loves you? Let me help you. First of all, to ever say nobody here loves me. I have a question for everybody in the room. You ready for this? If you're born again and you know it, raise your hand. All right? Now, for you, you just raised your hand and said you're born again, and you know it? Let me help you. Guess what's in you? The love of God. For you to ever say somebody doesn't love you is to say there are no born-again believers on the planet. 
There's nobody saved, and that's why nobody loves me, because that love is not in any, any heart of any individual believer. Well, they sure don't show it. Oh, well, number one, let me help you. Your closest friend is not the very humans that are on the planet. It's supposed to be Jesus Christ. Number two, Jesus himself, uh, God said, excuse me, God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. So if you're feeling alone, it's, you're, you're telling me a lot about your spiritual walk with God. If you're feeling alone, you certainly aren't spending time with him because how could you spend time with him and not obviously feel loved? Well, I can't, I, I just can't sense or know God. It's not like having another human around. Oh, let me help you. It's far better than a human because they're not a human. They're a spirit inside there. He's a spirit. He's a person. He either is or he isn't. He is. He lives in you by the way of the Holy Spirit. What you're revealing is you don't know too much about obviously drawing near to him because if you did, you'd never be alone. You'd never feel alone. You know why Christians feel alone? Don't get mad at me. You know why Christians feel alone? It's called self-pity. What's self-pity? You're focused on yourself. When's the last time you got your focus off you? You just decided, you know what I'm going to do at church? I'm going to go love on everybody else. I'm going to go talk to them and ask them how they're doing, how their family's doing. Just love on them. Say, man, it's so good to see you. So glad to be around you. You know what the person does that comes and sits and actually waits for everybody to come to them? They're looking at themselves. I think Jesus said something about this. So I'm getting a lot of good amens off of this. So I'll stick with it for a minute. I think Jesus said something about this. You know what he said about it? You know what Jesus said about it? You're a son or daughter of God. You're living like him if you're spirit led. Right? You know what Jesus said about it? I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to church to be served. I came to serve. If you think nobody in church loves you, I have a question for you. Jesus went to church every Sabbath with people that wanted to kill him. They want to take his life. And he showed up. You know why? He wasn't there for them. He was there to serve God. He was there to love on his father, love on people, even the ones that didn't love him. They couldn't love him clearly. Obviously, they weren't born again in the way he could. But I'm telling you, folks, this is important. What are you talking about right now, Pastor? You're kind of offended me. I'm going to tell you why you're offended, because you're living out of your soul. You're not living out of your spirit. This is why Jesus couldn't get offended. You can't offend people that live out of their spirit, man. And I'm trying to explain something. If you're affected in this way by your emotions, you're still soulish driven. You're not living in God's design, and you're not going to walk in power and authority as a believer on the planet, and Satan's going to take advantage of you. If the devil knows you can get your feelings hurt easy, oh, he has no problem. No problem bringing people across your path to hurt your feelings. So you and I got to realize this. We're not to go by our emotions. Think of every decision for a moment. I mean, don't spend a lot of time here, okay? Think of every decision you made totally out of your emotions. That was truly nothing more than your flesh and how painful that decision actually resulted in. Imagine if Christians did not live by emotions. Well, we're supposed to be emotional. No, you're supposed to keep your emotions under control. You're not, there ain't a verse in all the Bible that says you're supposed to be emotional. You know what the Bible says? It's supposed to be spiritual, not emotional. You can have emotions, you'll experience them, but it'll all be controlled by your spirit man. It'll be a whole lot better emotions. I said it'll be a whole lot better emotions. Well, God even got angry. Yeah, he did. He got angry, but you know what he got angry at? He got angry at the devil. He got angry at the works of the devil. God's never mentioned anywhere in the Bible hating any individual. He hates the works of Satan. He hates the works of sin. He does not clearly like the works of those who are human beings who go the way of sin, and he said so. But he doesn't hate the individual. You know why? God's love. He's not hate. Well, that's that's a form of hatred. No, it's a form of righteous indignation against that which is wrong and sinful and harmful to people. It's a whole, whole lot of difference in that. Whole lot. Well, I don't have a right to have righteous indignation when somebody does me wrong. No, you're to forgive them just like Jesus forgave them. Any good amens tonight? Amen. So understand this. You are not to be emotionally led. Say it. I'm not emotionally led. Tell your neighbor, you are not to be emotionally led. If you're emotionally led, folks, it's going to cause a whole lot of harm in your life. Yeah. 
whole lot of harm. The more I've learned this, especially in relationship to other people, especially in my marriage, and especially in relationship to other aspects of what I do as a pastor, it'll make a huge difference in how you impact people's lives. And it'll certainly make a huge difference in how you live your life. I want to say one more thing about this before I read my verse. Can I say one more thing about it? The more you allow emotions to rule, what's one of the emotions that actually has a form of a connotation of a negative to it as it relates to people? Fear. Satan loves to use fear to get people in bondage. And it's an emotional thing. It begins with an aspect of emotions getting out of control. And if he can control you by fear, you think back, folks, come on, it wasn't that long ago. When COVID hit, how many Christians were living in absolute fear? Now, if you're living in fear, what are you living out of? Your soul. What are you opening the door for? COVID. What are you opening the door for? Whatever Satan wants to try to bring across your path. Fear is faith in reverse. It's a faith in something other than God. If you're afraid of a disease or sickness, you've got faith that you may get it. You listening? So what did COVID do? COVID showed a lot of believers are not walking under God's design, sadly. Now, not a lot in this church. I mean, we were mad that we had to shut down at all. But I'm just telling you, a lot of Christians. Do you know that there's still Christians today? I, I can't call them Christians because they're not following Jesus' example. I understand why they're doing it, not in the sense meaningly that they mean to stay away. But there's still Christians today haven't gone back to church. You go to stores still? Have you seen folks with masks on? Do you know some of these are quote-unquote born-again people? What are they so fearful of? It's a sad thing to watch anybody live in fear. I'm not making light of it. I'm just telling you, if you're ruled by your emotions, guess what? The door's open for Satan to take advantage of that in your life. But guess what perfect love does? Come on. Guess what perfect love does? 1 John 4, cast out fear. Meaning that you don't have it because you've never been given a spirit of fear. But when it tries to rule you, guess what perfect love does? Perfect love does exactly what perfect love said it would. My God so loves me that he's already provided for me deliverance from every such virus, including COVID. That's right. yeah. And if I know that and I walk in the reality of that perfect love, guess what that perfect love does? Kicks fear to the curb. That's right. Guess what it does to Satan in that, area, that aspect of your life? Slams the door in his face. Can't come here. Can't come here. Why? My God loves me. So, number four, to be able to deal with our emotions, what must we do, church, to not let our emotions rule us? We have to learn to obey the voice of our spirit. Walking out obedience to the word deals with your will, but not your emotions. Now, if you don't deal with your will, you'll have bad emotions. You understand that? Right? If I, don't, if I ignore number three and I don't practice what I need to do to walk out the will of God, how I many you know that's going to affect your emotions in a negative way? But even if I'm dealing with practicing the will of God, how I many know I still got emotions to deal with? Emotions based on things that happen, things I see, things that go on. So I have to understand how do I deal with those emotions? Through the voice of your spirit. Through the voice of your spirit. So this is where your spirit starts getting involved, if you let him. Look at James, tells us this, James chapter 1. If you're with me, say amen. amen. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, let no one say when he's tempted. Now what does the devil tempt you to do? What's he tempting you to do? Primarily. Get out of the will of God. He's going to do that with what? Old fleshly desires. Old fleshly desires. Notice this. 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. Why? God's never going to tempt you to get out of the will of God. Why? For God cannot be tempted by what? Evil. Nor does he himself do what? Tempt anybody. But each one is what? Tempted. Say each one. We all will be. You're never excluded from temptation of the enemy to get out of the will of God. Each one is tempted when he's what? Drawn away to his, notice this, drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Well, who's enticing us with these old fleshy desires? The devil is. Well, what's one of the primary ways Satan tries to tempt you to get you in a position to go go in relationship to your old desires of your old flesh? Emotions. Emotions get you angry, get you frustrated, get you mad, get you ticked off, get you fearful, get you frustrated, get you stressed. 
15, notice this. Then when this desire has conceived, so we let it go on too far, and it conceives, it gives birth to sin. Now we're missing the mark with God. And this sin, when it's full grown, will do what? Bring forth death. So we're right back to Romans 8, folks. Because what happens if we allow the flesh to rule? Death was the result. Separation from the Zoe life of God. You don't lose your salvation. just means you're not walking in God's design. You're not going to experience the kind of life God wants you to walk in. 16, do not be what? Tell me out loud, please. Everybody say it for, for me, please. Do not be what? Come on, out loud. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights. That's the Father of spirits. With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And of his own will, verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, born again. 19, so then, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be what? So here we go. He just talked about what? What did he talk about? He talked about temptation. He talked about the fact that he's not tempting you, but that the evil one will tempt you with carnal fleshly desires of your own to try to get you out of the will of God. What's the primary way he's going to try to tempt you in these settings of these verses to get you out of the will of God? 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be what? Swift to speak, slow to hear, and quick to get angry. But that's how a lot of Christians live. A lot of Christians are quick to immediately speak. Why? Out of their emotions. Out of their anger. Out of their frustration. Out of their fear. You name it. But that's not what he said to do. What did he say to do? Because of these temptations of the old flesh to get out of the will of God, what must you do? You got to be quick to do what? Tell me. You got to be swift to hear. You got to be what? Slow to speak. And you got to be what? This is how you overcome your emotions. Because slow to wrath means if I'm quick to hear and I'm slow to speak, it's not likely that my emotions are going to rule me here. I'm going to keep them under check as a spirit being. Amen. Come on. I'm going to keep these emotions under check as a spirit being and not live out what my emotions want me to do here. But I got to be quick to hear. Amen. You better learn. You better practice. You better get good at being quick to hear, slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Say it with me. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Say it like you mean it. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Again, quick to hear, slow to speak. Quit putting that in the reverse. So what this means is you and I have to recognize when something's said, when things happen, when stuff takes place, our mind starts telling us stuff, somebody else starts saying something to us, where do we know that obviously we need to slow down and take time to really stop and listen to a different direction here Hey, I'll tell you how you know. When your emotions start rising up. When you sense your emotions start coming up, I try to do this with married couples all the time that argue and fight. I tell them, I said the most mature one in the room at the time you get so heated in argument is the one that can turn their back and walk away and said, let me go talk to God and I'll come back. Because if you've already gotten to that point that it's out of control, the best thing you can do to get out of the flesh is get out of that presence of that other person who's still angry, mad, or upset, or whatever, and go spend some time with God, and go draw near to Him, listen to what your spirit man's saying, listen to which God's going to reveal to your spirit man, and if you'll do that, then you can calm down, get your emotions under control, and then later come back and try to talk about whatever the issue was and resolve it. Well, they just won't listen. They just then pray for them. But going on and creating a further argument is not going to cause any resolve to come about. Nobody ever resolved anything arguing. Nobody ever resolved anything arguing. There is no such resolve in arguments. It just causes more opportunity for Satan to get your emotions out of control. And what has he done now? What has he done by getting you into the emotional stage to be able to start speaking out of those emotions? He sucked you into the temptation. He got you with that little enticement. Come on, get mad. Go ahead. Get back at him. Go ahead. Holler, scream. They're doing it at you. Don't let them get away with that. Go ahead. And what you're doing is you're letting your emotions rule you. You're back in your soul. 
Your spirit's being kicked to the curb back there in the inner Holy of Holies. And the Holy Spirit has no ability to bring healing here. The Holy Spirit has no ability to bring answers. Most of the time, arguments are over things of a disagreement. Guess who knows the answer? Guess who knows the resolve? But the, the fact that you're operating out of emotions means what? He's not involved. You can't hear him. You can't hear what he's saying. Why? You're not functioning out of your spirit. You're functioning out of your soul. And when you're functioning out of soul, guess what God doesn't speak to? He doesn't speak to your soul. He speaks to your spirit. If you want the answer to the problem, if you want to fix whatever's wrong, if you want to deal with whatever needs to be corrected, getting mad and hollering and screaming about it is never going to resolve it. Never. All you're doing is giving in to the devil's temptation. You need to realize every time you go off the emotional scale, what you just did is Satan brought that little bait by you just like a fish, and you said, oh, yeah, that looks good, and you snatched onto it, and now you're hooked. And he's got you right where he wants you, and he's reeling you into his plan. He's reeling you into his boat and getting you out of God's design. You're not walking in dominion and authority. You're, you might think you are by hollering and screaming, but you are not. You are walking a lower form of life, a carnal fleshly form of life. And I'm preaching better. I'm already out of time. But you got to learn this. You got to get this. If we don't address this issue with our emotions in how we're supposed to do biblically what our emotions need to be dealt with, we are not going to keep this part of our soul under control. If you don't actually deal with listening to the voice of your spirit to deal with your emotions, guess where you wind up? Guess what you wind up doing? Your spirit gets shut off. You begin to go backwards and you're no longer practicing the word. You're now into your will. And you're no longer walking in the reality of the new man who you now renewed your mind to. You're right back to walking in the old man. And guess who's dominating again? The soul is. I want you to get this, church. I want you to please hear this. By the Holy Ghost. I want you to hear this word from the Holy Ghost. You operate out of your soul. You're living in the lower Adamic nature. The fallen, lower Adamic nature. Is that where you want to live? Because that's where you're going to live, living out of your soul. But that's not where God designed for you to live. Amen. Amen. He designed for you to live as a three-part being, functioning out of your spirit. I want you to get this in a way that hopefully it's more practical for you to understand how we do this. So, if I am doing what's necessary to make God's word first place, I'm renewing my mind by meditating on the word, practicing the word to get my will and submission to him. I still got to deal with this emotional part of me. And it's the biggest area which Satan brings these temptations, thus saith the book of James. He just told you from verses 13 all the way down through verses 18 about the temptation of the enemy with your old desires. And then he explains what it relates to in 19. You got to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now understand, you're already right with God by a gift. But that word, in the context of which it's used, the word righteousness in the New Testament can refer to two things. It can refer to the gift of righteousness which you've been given. You have to look at the context. Or it can refer to doing what's right in the sight of God. Here it's referring to doing what's right in the sight of God. You don't lose your righteousness. No. You're no less righteous getting in the flesh. You don't, in the sense that now all of a sudden you lost your salvation. No, you're still right with God. You're just not functioning out of that very person. But here it's talking about doing what's right in the sight of God. Guess what you'll never do in relationship to walking in what's right in the sight of God. Guess what you'll never do in relationship to that as a believer, as a, as a being on the planet, if you get off into your soul. You'll never walk in the, what's right in the sight of God. If you're ruled by your emotions, forget it. It'll never happen. Amen. Never happen. If I'm ruled by my emotions, guess what I'm not doing? What's right in the sight of God? Guess what I'm not walking in? God's design for my life. I'm going to keep repeating this stuff over and over and over, folks, because some people are waking up. Some people are saying, Pastor, thank you. Man, I'm finally getting it. Because we need to be practicing this every day. Every single day. I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot much more peaceful, awesome, powerful, loving life to live than ruled by your emotions. It's so much better. I said it's so much better. You will never control other people's emotions around you, and they'll always be around you. 
But guess what? The more you learn to not let them control you, guess who's going to obviously not bring those people around as much anymore? Satan isn't. I'm not talking about your spouse or other friend. I'm just talking about other people. If he knows you can easily get caught up in your emotions, he'll bring lots of people around to mess with your emotions. You listening? I'm serious about that. But the devil also knows if you get to the point where you've whipped his tail time and again by not giving in to that, he's not going to keep trying the same thing over and over and over. He's going to go at somebody else with that. He might come to you in a different way, but he's not going to keep trying that. It's not working. He knows if it is or not. He just sees what you do. Can I get a better amen? How, pastor, do we not allow ourselves to be ruled by our emotions? You must listen for and obey the voice of your spirit which is known as your conscience. And that takes doing what? That takes shutting your mouth. That takes quieting your mind, even while the emotions are bubbling inside you. That takes closing your mouth. Be quick to... Come on, here, slow to... What What am I listening for, Pastor? What am I listening for? My spirit man. He knows exactly what to tell me. He knows exactly... What to reveal to me that I'm to say, not to say. If you'll listen to your spirit, man, your emotions out of control and your soul, your mouth is just about to spout off. If you'll take time to shut your mouth and quiet your mind and look inward and listen to your conscience, you know what you'll find out from your conscience? Uh, Better not say that. Has anybody ever had a time in your life that you knew your conscience told you? Don't say that. Don't do that. And you did it anyway. And did it turn out good? Did it work out for God's design? No, it did not. Because you went right back into the lower Adamic nature. Well, I'll tell you, Pastor, I just don't know that I can do this. God would never told you that you could do this if it was not possible. James 1, literally in James chapter 1, in these two verses, 19 and 20, but especially 19, he would have never told you to be quick to hear if it was not possible. He would have never told you to be slow to speak if it was not possible. And let me explain something to you as husbands and wives in closing, because I, I got to quit. I'm out of time. I wish I could go further what I wanted to show you tonight, but we'll show you Sunday. I want you to get this. I'm not going to go beyond what the Holy Spirit tells me to give you till we get this. But you need to understand this. Women tend not, now I understand there's some exceptions. Women tend to talk more than men. Ladies, when there's problems in your marriage or situation with your husband, you don't need to try to get more words out of your husband if he's already emotional. Well, come on, I want to know what you think. If you already know he's upset, the last thing you need to do is being trying to coerce him into talking more. When I started learning this, and I started getting in a position where I quit responding so fast with words, and I began to work on myself to deal with this, sometimes when I would get upset at Kathy or a situation, I would sit there and tell myself, don't say a word right now, just shut up and just listen to what she's saying, and then listen to your spirit. And then I would often have people get mad. Aren't you going to say anything? Not yet. Are you not listening? Oh, yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening to somebody else. I'm listening to my spirit man, what I'm to say here. See, because if I just spout off and say something, you may not like what I say. If I don't get slow to speak, come on, and quick to hear. You should, if, you, if you literally have uh, somebody else in your life walking this out, well, let me take some time to think about it. Don't get mad because they're not immediately responding to what you're asking them. Amen. Give them time to be do what? Quick to hear their spirit, slow to talk to you. Give them time to literally think about it. Give them time to listen to their heart and find out what their heart is saying. Amen. Well, I don't think they're doing that. Well, it's not up to you whether they're doing that or not. But if you know they're emotional and mad and you're trying to get them to say something, what do you think's going to come out? <laughs> come on, man. It's like you've already primed the pump, right? You've already, you, you've already stacked the deck. You've already, you know, filled the tube full of dynamite and you're just lighting the fuses saying, go ahead, just spout off. <laughs> no, you need, to, you need to disengage the dynamite first, get the stuff out of there and do what? Actually have calmer voices prevail. <laughs> And I want to get this across again. I'm going to say it again. If you pop out of your emotions, of it, out of your mouth, what you want to say, you're, you're not hearing God. Amen. You're not hearing God in that situation. 
God could bring resolve. God could bring answer. God could bring insight. God could bring what needs to be known. God could bring an, a, a total change of that situation. You know, the Bible's very clear about this. You ready for this? You ready for this? That's three of you. I'll wait till the rest of you get ready. If not, we'll pray tonight for about an hour to get you ready. You ready for this? You know what the Bible says? A soft answer turns away wrath. Because a soft answer is not based on emotions and anger and frustration. A soft answer is based on what the love of God and my spirit man is telling me to say. So you got to understand this. If you get in a position ruled by emotions, guess who you just cut off from the conversation and the ability to get answers to that situation? God. And I'll show you why Sunday. I'll prove it to you from the scriptures on Sunday. Jesus himself only did and only said what he knows the Father was doing and what the Father was saying. How? How did he do that? How did he know what the Father was doing? How did he know what the Father was saying? I'll show you Sunday. Because it's the same way you are going to learn to listen to the voice of your spirit, man. Amen. And therefore not do what? Be ruled by your emotions. Now, if you're already mad at something I said tonight, you're the person I'm talking to. And I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you understand. Emotionally ruled people, you're living on a lower level. The devil is taking advantage of you and you don't even see it. How in the world could you catch a bass if he knows that that lure is not obviously an actual uh, true, pe- a true fish or true bait, whatever you're using, uh, whatever. How, could, how in the world could you catch him unless you convince him what, what actually is not actually real and true looks like it is? To the degree he's so enticed, he'll latch onto it, and then boom, you got him. Right. How is that possible? You convince him that it looks so good, he thinks it's the real thing, what he should do, and he latches onto it. See, the devil's trying to get you to be ruled by your emotions, thinking that this is the way you handle it, this is the way you deal with it. You don't let them get away with that. You don't put up with that. You don't listen to that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did Jesus listen to? He stood before Pontius Pilate and Herod. Two separate times and was lied about and didn't say a word. You listening? You can walk in the very works of Jesus. So again, two things. Emotionally ruled, you're in the lower Adamic nature. If you're in the lower Adamic nature, number two, guess who you're not hearing from? God. Guess who you just cut out of the conversation? The only one that's got the answers, the insight, the wisdom, the help you need, it's God. And Christians don't realize, functioning out of your emotions, you shut God off because he does not speak to your soul. He doesn't reveal stuff to your soul, mind, will, and emotions. He didn't reveal stuff to Jesus that way. And we'll see that on Sunday. Amen. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.